This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, our five interlocutors today. Toby Miller is a professor of um, Media and Cultural Studies and indeed has chaired the Department of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Riverside. He's uh, a person uh, of international repute and note, writing about cultural studies uh, and uh, media, cinema, um, uh, creative societies, um, democracy, and a whole range of other questions. Uh, too long uh, to list over here, but I uh, urge you to... Um, to, to go and uh, look at his work as well. Uh, Catherine Fisk to his left, uh, at least physically, um, uh, is a uh, Chancellor's Professor of Law at UC uh, Irvine, uh, one of the founding members of the, uh, of the new law school, having come from Duke uh, University a couple of years ago. She works on, uh, mainly on um, uh, labor and employment law and on uh, the impact of technology on uh, labor and employment. Uh, to her uh, left is Philomena Essard, who once was known to have taught here in women's studies and African-American studies at UC Irvine uh, after having spent 20 years at the University of Amsterdam um, in development-related uh, studies, <coughs> and uh, is now a professor uh, in a very creative PhD uh, program at Antioch University called Leadership and Change. Uh, to her left is Gary Olson, who also recently came to the University of California, Irvine. He's a professor in ICS in Information and Computer Science, uh, and um, his uh, was previously uh, at the University of Michigan. As uh, his his work is on uh, technologies for remote collaboration, so something, of course. Uh, of uh, acute importance to us uh, in uh, the context of this conversation and how this might impact uh, uh, how we do what we do uh, in the context of the academy. Uh, and uh, he has also done considerable work on uh, design, uh, design in relation to uh, technology and technology development. And uh, to his left, um, uh, I hesitate to say both physically and otherwise, uh, is, Angela <laughs> is Angela Davis, who probably needs very little introduction to this campus. Uh, Angela is a professor emeritus, having recently retired from the University of California, Santa Cruz, in the History of Consciousness uh, program, also in um, feminist studies uh, on that campus. Uh, has a very long history, uh, both of intellectual work on issues of race, class, and gender, uh, of prison studies, on uh, work on theories of slavery and imprisonment, uh, uh, on the blues uh, and other related uh, issues, uh, and uh, has been teaching here this last quarter uh, in the critical theory emphasis. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all, uh, and uh, I look forward to a really uh, terrific and engaging conversation. Toby Miller will speak first. Thank you. I'm going to do three things in this talk. Uh, I'll offer a capsule history of the US Research University. I'll endeavor to explain the current conjuncture. And I'll present you with the results of a rigorous survey. But as a teaser, I'm going to tell you about the survey instrument, which I designed last Saturday night uh, in Los Files when I asked a puppeteer, an artist, a perfumier, and an assistant professor, each of whom were first-generation college students when they enrolled, why they went to university. This was my way of inquiring what universities might be for, and I'll present my findings to you right at the end. So, the classic US model of higher education, what does it say it does? It says that it equips students with a liberal inclination that respects knowledge of a topic and for a purpose, rather than simply knowledge by a particular person, like Bill Gates, or Brian Eno, who actually wrote that piece of music you just heard. 
The model places its faith in a discourse of professionalism, not charisma, if you think in Weberian terms. In other words, it makes people believe in openly available knowledge, not secret magic. This is secular and, by and large, I think, a good thing. But liberalism also relies on the concept of human capital, that there should be a mutual investment of time, of money, and of training by both society and subject in the interest of creating a core of able-minded employees and willing patriots schooled by docile professors. To that end, we have seen the advent of higher education as an industry with students as investors. So the question is, how did this state of affairs come to pass? Since the 1830s, when the first waves of white settler European immigration across classes began in earnest, U.S. higher education has generated practices and knowledges for use by the state and business and has also sought to help manage the population with all its internal differentiation. From the 1850s, when the country began its industrial takeoff, the emergent bourgeoisie sought partnerships with tertiary education to develop a skilled workforce. But higher education really flowered a century ago, at the turn of the 20th century. Corporations placed more and more faith in applied science via electromagnetism, geology, chemistry, and electricity. By the 20s, Harvard had a business school, NYU had a Macy's-endorsed retail school, and Cornell had a hotel school. The large research universities, astonishingly, actually expanded their capacity during the Depression. And the two world wars provided additional pump priming and a premium on practicality from the federal government. Of course, the shop was really set up to cater to corporate and military research and development in the late 1950s via the Cold War. Today, these tasks of governmentalization in a Foucauldian sense and commodification in a Marxist sense have merged in their concerns and methods. Congress provides more than a billion dollars in direct grants to universities, and that's apart from the peer-reviewed funds available through the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Corporations, by contrast, gave US research universities about $850 million in 1985 and almost four and a half billion in 1995. This development dates from a piece of legislation called the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. Evan Bayh, one of the sponsors of this, is just about to leave the Senate. It permits non-profit educational institutions to own and commercialize inventions, provided that the state can use them as it sees fit. Prior to the Act, prior to 1980, US research universities collectively accounted for about 250 patents a year. By the turn of the 21st century, the figure was closer to 5,000. In 1999, the top 100 research schools received $641 million in royalties, in part thanks to this Bayh-Dole Act. That was up by almost 500 million since 1995. My concern with this is that the idea of working in the public interest may be compromised through things like, for example, amendments not at the federal level but at the state level to legislation throughout the country that have quietly exempted publicly funded scientists from conflict of interest responsibilities. These conflict of interest responsibilities still apply, for example, to personnel officers and to refuse workers, to garbage workers. One of the main areas where this has been a problem is medicine. The pharmaceutical industry's proportion of US health research, health research conducted in universities, was just 13% in 1980. By 1995, it was 52%. Marketing decides how to develop a new compound pharmacologically once it has been uncovered by asking the following questions. Will it be announced as a counter to depression or to premature ejaculation? Will it be announced in journal X or journal Y? and which scholars will be chosen to front it and to produce consensus over its benefits. Major advertising agencies that work with pharmaceutical corporations have subsidiaries that conduct clinical trials. Scholarly legitimacy is a key part of this merchandising. So Pfizer, for example, big drug company, describes academic publication as a means, and I quote, to support directly and indirectly the marketing of our products, unquote. Medical education and communications companies provide ghostwriting services paid for by corporations that deliver copy to academics and clinicians. They even pay them for signing these articles, some of which they may never have read, let alone written. One in ten papers in leading medical journals are the work of ghosts. 
and an astounding 90% of articles published in the Journal of the American Medical Association derive from people paid by PharmaCorps, which pressure, in many cases, medical journals to print favourable findings in return for lucrative advertising copy. But it's not just places like medical schools that are problems. Let me give a similar example from closer to my own field. In 1996, the National Academy of Sciences held a workshop for academia, Hollywood and the Pentagon on, on simulation and electronic games. The next year, the National Research Council announced a collaborative agenda on popular culture and the military, how one could help the other. It convened meetings to streamline projects from special effects to training simulations, from immersive technologies to simulated networks. Since that time, untold numbers of academic journals and institutes about games have developed close ties to the Pentagon. They generate research designed to test and augment the potential of games to ideologize, to hire, and to instruct the population. So I guess you can see I'm trying to suggest this is not a particularly new tendency. It goes back to the days of the Macy's retail school at NYU and so on, but it's really become a more orchestrated, organized, and centrally determined tendency. To give one example, just down the street from here, actually Marina Del Rey, USC's Institute for Creative Technologies is a means of articulating scholars, film and television producers, and game designers to military work. The Institute was formally opened by the Secretary of the Army and the head of the Motion Picture Association of America. It started with $45 million of the military's budget 10 years ago, a figure that was doubled in its 2004 renewal. The Institute uses Pentagon money and Hollywood muscle to test out homicidal technologies and narrative scenarios under the aegis of faculty from film, from engineering, and from communications. For instance, ICT produces Pentagon recruitment tools such as Full Spectrum Warrior. Anybody here play Full Spectrum Warrior? No? Highly recommended. Full Spectrum Warrior doubles, in the words of the Pentagon, as a training device for military operations in urban terrain. In fact, the Pentagon and the Institute boast that Full Spectrum Warrior was, and I quote, the game that captured Saddam, because the men who dug Saddam Hussein out had been trained with it. The mavens of ICT and their fellow travelers also claim a grand intellectual standing, that theirs is, as they put it modestly, and I quote, the fourth great domain of science, unquote. Okay, so that's on the research side, and I'm more than halfway through. Turning away from research, we can see a tendency across the entire degree-granting sector of transferring the costs of schools away from governments and towards students. And this gets back to what I began with in terms of this human capital model of shared responsibility. Students are regarded more and more as customers who must manage their own lives by investing in human capital. If you go back 30 years, the three levels of government in this country accounted for 48.3% of funding teaching. By, by uh, 10 years ago, that proportion was 38%, and it's all heading south. And of course, that trend towards reliance on tuition doubled student debt between 1992 and 2000. By 2005, state investment in public university students was at its lowest level in a quarter of a century. And more importantly than that, because often we're told this is because of a shrinkage in taxable revenue or the impossibility of funding increasingly expensive university systems, this is about a very deliberate decision in terms of the allocation of public funds. Tertiary education's overall proportion of public appropriations in this country was 6.7% in 1975. In 2000, it was 4.5%. This dual faculty student research, teaching, studying, dependence on private sources is twinned with what we might call the mimetic managerial fallacy, a process whereby governments and university administrators construct corporate life as their desired other. This not only makes for untimely influences on research and teaching, but on the very administration of universities, which are increasingly prone to puerile managerial warlock craft superstitions with words like excellence and quality control. Academic institutions have come to resemble the entities they now serve, as colleges are transformed into big businesses. The mimetic managerial fallacy also leads to more and more forms of surveillance. It's long been the case that regional accrediting institutions vouched for the quality of US degrees, and to do so, they've been in place for well over a century, they've tried to vet the quality of teaching, rightly so. 
But since the 1970s, we've seen ever-increasing performance-based evaluations of teaching conducted at departmental and decanal levels, rather than in terms of the standard of an overall school. Today, such methods are used by 95% of departments. These systems frequently link budgets to outcomes, in keeping with the prevailing beliefs of public policy mandarins, their restless quest to conduct themselves like corporate elves monkey. As successive superstitions came along, administrators fell in line with their beguiling doxa. Along the way, faculty-student ratios worsen and reporting, surveillance and administration increase. Clearly, and this is the sort of downside of much of what I'm saying, but I hope there's an upside which you'll see in a moment, the current conjuncture is one of chaos, as the businesses that US higher education sought to serve and to emulate are suddenly revealed to be naked and sagging. But even if the state had the wisdom to sustain the system through the crisis until tax receipts picked up once more, which we keep being told will happen, would there be any point if the crisis in fact had no end point? What if the crisis isn't about tax receipts, either in California or anywhere else? What if it's part of a brutal transformation that irrevocably shrinks the public sector? thereby finalizing the long-standing wish of the Republican Party to, and I quote the famous expression that Reagan lived by, starve the beast. Everybody familiar with this starve the beast expression? The beast means the population, understood as those receiving the support of tax-funded programs. This is a turning point then in educational history, when pages are torn from a playbook and lives are torn asunder. Dedicated scholars who had made the decision to join the ranks of the gentry poor rather than follow mammon find that the supposed trade-off that they might pursue research, secure them a knowledge that their basic welfare was looked after, no longer applies. And the same, of course, is the problem for students. That said, the tremors that are undulating across corporate agendas and governmental methods may enable us to combat them by confronting what these systems amount to in terms of research and teaching and seeing how they have dramatically coalesced over the last two decades. So those opening core concepts that I began with, commodification and governmentality, need to be identified, they need to be problematized, and they need to be turned against themselves in any struggle for progressive education, not just embraced or misrecognized or treated as opposites. Utilizing accountability to reveal corporate power over intellectual production, as per the Institute for Creative Technologies or medical journals, or pointing out to students the negative realities of a consumer address as per the notion that, yes, you can say, I've paid for my study, therefore you should pass me, but think what that means in terms of student debt and also the notion of a practice of knowledge passed on from those who spent years studying, that if we can point those things out, if we can learn from them ourselves, if they can be pointed out to us, there can be a fruitful dynamic in and around commodification and governmentality. We should denounce the militarization of academia as per the actions taken by professional bodies in things like anthropology and belatedly psychology against their co-optation by the Bush and Obama war machines. And we must shift into reverse the mimetic managerial fallacy by implementing collaborative, not competitive, and learned, not leached forms of work. But it's a massive task. Let me give you a couple of things I'd suggest and then give you the results of my little survey and I'll be done within a minute. I'd like to see tertiary education understood as a right in the same way that primary and secondary education is understood as a right, that it's not a benefit and it should therefore be funded fully in the way that those streams of education are funded. Now I understand that there's an argument to be made for the massive expenditure that's required for universities, especially research universities, to function because so many people spend so little time teaching, they spend so much time researching and administering by contrast with, say, high schools. One way that you could get around that uh, would be instead of having an upfront fee paid by students, you would have a retrospective but progressive graduate tax instead of fees, which is being looked at in many parts of the world. It will be based on your not earning potential, not your parents' income, but the wealth that you have as you go on through life. Secondly, I'd like to see an end to all the tax breaks for private universities. I spent many years teaching at one. It's a very ugly world, in my opinion. And thirdly, I'd like us to become real models of self-governance, not as per the banalities of UC-crats who respond to every new idea with an acronym or a number from a manual, 
not overly married, overly mortgaged senior faculty who know regulations but don't know newness. In short, not the kind of missing Federalist paper that was foisted on UC faculty instead of unionization. No, I mean the self-governance that really does make universities at their best heterotopias. Complicit, disappointing, but with a sealant separating them from the state and commerce. And I got these ideas, that notion of that heterotopia, from my incredibly socially scientific and reliable survey. So I'll go back to my survey subjects, the puppeteer, the artist, the perfumier, and the assistant professor. Why did they go to college? Right? And they didn't all go in the United States. Their answers oscillated between two poles. One was escape, the other was continuity. The escape was to do with eluding small towns, escaping strong families, and getting away from big ideologies. On the other hand, the continuity was to do with just going on to the next thing, the logical step after you finished your secondary education, even if mother and father and grandparents, if you knew them, had not themselves done this. Taken together, that oscillation between escape and continuity made me think about scholarly heterotopia as an interplay of repetition and difference. Right? Or an interplay of repetition and difference. A site to es express the desire for familiarity, but also innovation. I think that's what universities are for, providing both history and newness. Thank you. It's a very great honor to be on this panel. I have five points to make about the university that I am for. The first one is to go back to the statement that's cliche, but I actually really believe in it, which is that a university serves three functions, teaching, scholarship, and service. We do all of these things. I think they are all extremely important. And who do we do them for? We do them for the sake of today's public, and I mean public very broadly. We do it for the sake of the public of the future, some of whom will, are students when they grow up and are out in the world. Uh, some of it is generations in the future. Um, we do it for the sake of our culture, the society in which we live. And I'm a lawyer, I also believe we do it for the sake of our polity our government, maybe not the current government, but the government we want. For the sake of today's public and the public of the future, the university I'm for is a means of intergenerational class mobility. This is extraordinarily important for our society. The University of California today looks very different than the University of California that my parents went to in the early 1940s or that my grandfather went to in the early 19-teens. But for so many of the students that I see walking around UCI, for my parents, for my grandfather, what the University of California was was a way up uh, from a a family economic situation that was precarious indeed. Hard scrabble farming, um, desperate economic situation during the Depression. Um, and so for so many of our students whose families have come from around the world, this is an opportunity that is unparalleled. That's different than what universities, particularly elite universities, used to be. If you went to Harvard in the 1920s or even Princeton in the 19, early 1980s and late 1970s when I was an undergraduate, Elite university education was for the privileged, the children of the elites. And to make university education, I think, really meaningful for our society, we need to remember that we're not just educating the children of the elite, even when we are teaching at an elite university. Um, for the sake of today's and tomorrow's culture and politics, um, the university that I am for plays a role as a home for public intellectuals. It enables faculty to think freely, to speak out freely, to think really hard about what we think, to think critically all the time. And then I think we have an obligation to speak to the public, to educate the public in every possible way, not just our students, not just fellow scholars who can understand the lingo of our discipline, 
but to translate knowledge that we have for the world at large because there are millions and millions of people out there who would trade their job for our job in a nanosecond. We're very fortunate as, as full professors at an elite university to have the jobs we have. And I think every day that I need to share my knowledge in a way that is intelligible to them and that our culture and our polity depend on it. The university and the free and free thinking university is essential to a healthy democracy. In the history of the world, the countries that developed vibrant democracies going back a millennium or, mo or more were the ones that were committed to books, to literacy, to free inquiry. And those that had great universities found themselves in a very different position hundreds or, or uh, many hundreds of years on than those that didn't support and develop universities. And many of those differences are being played out in the global political uh, climate that we have today. Um, but I think what we have to do is speak honestly and think critically about what we think. Um, to think freely and critically about the government, regardless of what our party affiliation is. To say that when President Obama does something good, it's good and here's why, and when he doesn't, here's why. Recognizing, of course, that it's hard to criticize your friends, it's hard to praise your enemies, um, but it's our job because we don't keep our jobs or lose our jobs based on who's in uh, the executive branch or in the legislature, that it's our job to think critically about the government. The university is essential, of course, to a vibrant economy. We all know that it's no accident that Silicon Valley developed in California where it did, as opposed to Alabama or Mississippi or states that didn't have a commitment to great research universities. Um, and most importantly to me, the university lives and breathes diversity in every possible sense of the word. For me, that's easy when I think about racial, gender diversity, diversity of sexual orientation, etc. For many of us, it's hard when it refers to ideological diversity, in particular supporting the rights of students or of colleagues to say things that I think are false, hateful, destructive. But I believe that if we're really serious about diversity, the university needs to be the place where we can all say things that other people disagree with, that we listen hard when we disagree, and try and think about how to articulate the argument in opposition, or whether in fact there is an argument in opposition, or whether we need to revise our own thinking, rather than to say certain things can't be said, or certain speakers shouldn't be allowed to speak. I see this all the time in various communities. Every time Muslim students at UCI um, have an event that causes Jewish people around the world, I'm, or around the country, I'm Jewish, I get a wave of emails from people saying, how can you all allow that to happen at UCI? And I say, because UCI is dedicated to freedom of speech. That's why it happens. And the remedy for speech I hate is frankly more speech, not silencing speech that I might disagree with. And to try to respectfully engage and learn from the people that I think differently. I think we're actually doing a pretty good job at that at UCI for the most part. I think we get a lot of blame for when we have little gaps, uh, but I think we need to remember that it's a hard thing and that we're trying hard to do that. My second point is that, and not all of my points are going to be as long as number one, so relax. Uh, my second point is that a university is part of our patrimony, which is probably not the right word, but parental money, <laughs> um, like the Grand Canyon, like great museums. Um, it cannot be built in a short period of time. It takes decades, generations, hundreds of years to make a great university. The University of California, like the Grand Canyon, was built over a long period of time by many people and many forces that preceded us. It will be here when we are gone. And in my view, the university, like the ecological community or climate that we live in, um, is not ours to despoil. It is ours to leave in better shape than we found it in, or at least in as good of shape. Um, 
The University of California was not a great university 200 years ago. It didn't exist 200 years ago. It is one of now one of the greatest institutions of learning in the world. Um, it is a treasure that this state is lucky to have. It's a treasure that I am extraordinarily fortunate, extraordinarily fortunate to be a part of. Um, and quite honestly, I don't think any of us, uh, not the legislature, not the governor, not the regents, not the administration, not the faculty, not the students, not the staff, have the right to destroy it by deliberate or by neglectful or by cowardly acts. Um, if I could make one legal reform, I'm a lawyer, I think about that, I would think that what we need to do is create all of us affiliated with the university, including, frankly, the legislature, the governor, and the regents, in the role of fiduciaries. A fiduciary is a legal concept, meaning that you have an obligation to act not in your own interest, but in the interest of somebody else. And I think we're fiduciaries for the University of California, and there are obligations that come with that. Um, my third point is that the university performs a very vital public service. When I think about our mission of service, one of the things I think about is what we're trying to do at the new law school here at UCI. We're trying to create a law school that is both great in the traditional academic reputational measures of that because we think by doing so we are doing the greatest service for our students and for this university but also one that is unconventional, one that challenges the fundamental conservatism of the American legal profession and the American legal educational system. We want our school to be dedicated to public service and the public interest, but we recognize that many of our students will define public interest work in a way that I personally don't embrace, but they embrace. But I'm okay with that. We also recognize, of course, that um, professional education depends on private fundraising. At the University of California, at all the UC law schools, tuition is already at fun almost at private university levels. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that the legislature, when they decided to stop funding public education, in, public tertiary education at historically high levels, that because students, graduates of law schools and professional schools generally, had the capacity to go out and earn fairly substantial sums afterwards, the price that could be charged for that was higher. Um, I think we could argue about the wisdom of that choice generally, but it's the choice that we inherited when we came to start this law school. But what we have to do is create a model of professional education that acknowledges our dependence on private fundraising. My husband is the dean of the law school and I cannot tell you how much time I spend on private fundraising. Lots of rich people come to my house for dinner and drinks all the time. <laughs> um, while avoiding dependence on and inf undue influence of uh, the corporate interests that fund the education that we provide. I think that's a non-trivial challenge. It's a more uh, elaborate problem than I have time to describe here. Um, but until there is public funding for professional education, which is going to be in line way behind public funding <laughs> for educating undergraduates. Um, that is a challenge that we have to face. Um, but I think it's a doable challenge. Fourth, I want to talk a little bit about what a public university is. Historically, a public university, at least the University of California, was open to all qualified comers. In California, it was free. Even when I went to law school at the University of California at Berkeley, it was close to free. I spent $1,400 a year on law school at a time that had I chosen to go to Harvard or Yale or any place like that, I would have spent close to $14,000 a year. Um, but back then, it was less dependent on private philanthropy and was correspondingly more dependent on public financial support. In return, it had certain obligations to the, bu the public in exchange for the support it receives. 
Sometimes there were problems with that. Public universities around the country, especially law schools, sometimes find themselves in a difficult situation when the law students take on a pro bono legal project that involves suing somebody who is influential in the government. Uh, Tulane University Law School had a huge fracas over that issue. Um, and one of the jobs of the administration is to stand up to that. Um, Today, for better or for worse, um, public funding of tertiary education um, seems not willing to live up to what I regarded as its part of the bargain. We'll be, provide a great service for the public if you pay for it. I wish I could change the political situation that uh, we confront today, but I can't, and so we have to live in the environment that we find ourselves in. Absent that public support, it seems to me that it's not clear that a university can remain public in the sense of essentially free to all qualified students. We have three choices facing us today. We can either be fully supported by the public, probably not going to happen in the short term. We can become dependent on private sources of fundraising, whether that is tuition or philanthropy, and in the short term it will have to be tuition because it's simply not possible to raise the kind of endowment that you would need in order to be uh, not tuition dependent, or we can become mediocre. There is no fourth choice for the university. So my fifth point is what should we decide in the face of that choice? And here's where I think our obligations to the present and future public, to our culture and to our polity, require us to make a really hard choice. And it may be a controversial choice in this room. I suspect it's a controversial choice on this panel, but for the sake of free inquiry, I thought I might as well just put it out there. Um, I think if it's a choice between reliance on private money, including tuition increases, and mediocrity, I feel as I said, as a fiduciary to the university and to the various entities and peoples that it serves, I feel I have a fiduciary duty to pursue greatness, even if it means substantial increases in fees. Um, and I think the key then is how to do that without destroying what is great about the University of California that I benefited from, and certainly even more than me, my parents and my one grandparent who went to college. Um, I think that the university has to, unfortunately, increase fees. But when, I, when we do it, we need to be extremely redistributivist, and perhaps more so than we are. That has already happened at many UC professional schools. 30% of every tuition dollar that the professional schools take in must go back out to financial aid. Um, and what that means at UCI Law School right now, since all our students are on 100% scholarship and the scholarships are all funded with private money, for every additional student we admit, we have to go raise more scholarship dollars because the money we raise, 30 percent of it goes out to uh, the rest of the university. So what that means is that children who, like mine, have the benefit of growing up in families with money will pay more for their education. But frankly, I believe in progressive taxation, and I believe my children should pay more. If I can pay it, I should pay it, so that those whose parents cannot don't, aren't denied an education. Um, and so fee increases must be tied to aid increases. But I want to acknowledge that this is not a cost-free choice. Um, and what we have to do is mitigate the adverse consequences of what I suggest. The University of California is at risk of becoming like the great u private universities, and indeed the, some of the great public universities, like the University of Michigan or the University of Virginia, that already charge uh, fairly substantial tuition. It's at risk of becoming an institution that serves the children of the elite, and only the children of the elite. 
To some extent, that happens when the population growth exceeds the number of seats available at the university and the competition to get into a UC school is fierce. I have four kids. The third is in high school, and the two older ones did not have the grades to get into a UC school. Bright kids, underachievers in high school, um, the competition was fierce. You know, 20 years ago, sure, they could have gotten into a UC school, but not anymore. Um, that didn't bother me because they'd made a set of choices. I mean, it bothered me. I'm a mom, right? But it didn't bother me as a social justice matter because they'd made a set of choices about how to apply themselves, um, and they had to live with the consequences. But it would bother me um, if what happens is elite education advantages students who have had elite high school education and that when we recognize that not every qualified graduate of a California high school is going to be able to get into a UC school that we are equitable about how we decide who has the elite credentials that enable them to get in. That makes the admissions process an enormously complicated and time-consuming process um, particularly in light of Proposition 209. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to take on that challenge so that the University of California doesn't become the province of the elite. Um, I also think it's important that we do enough outreach that kids remember and s or kids understand uh, because they don't have the uh, ability to know um, why university education is important. In September, <laughs> Professor Susan Strait at UC Riverside wrote an extraordinarily eloquent op-ed piece in the LA Times about the role that UC Riverside played in her life and in the lives of her many students who were the first in their family to go to college. She described herself as, quote, an accidental professor, close quote, because she never thought she would go to college and never thought she would become a professor. The more expensive university education becomes, the more that UC schools writ, uh, run the risk that people like Professor Strait, whom I don't know, I only know what I read in the LA Times, I'm, you may know her, um, will think that it's out of their reach even when they have the capacity or the qualifications to get in. Which means that fundraising is going to be a part of the job, and I think a big part of the job, of a lot of us at UC administration and UC faculty. I already spend my time doing a certain amount of that because of who my spouse is, but I think that that's something that is a loss we will suffer because we will need to figure out how to raise the money to fund the education, but how to do it in a way that preserves academic freedom. Toby described some of the really deleterious consequences of relying on private money to fund research. And I think institutionally, the university that I am for is very committed to acknowledging that our missions of teaching, scholarship, and service, at least in this political climate, are going to be funded by private money, but doing it in a way that remembers that our constituency is not our donors, our constituency is not those students who want to treat education as a consumerist, I paid for it, therefore I'm entitled, um, is not their parents who say, look, for $50,000 a year, you better do X for my kid, but instead is recognizes that although we are a beneficiary of that money, we owe our obligations to the public, to the future, and to the kind of intellectual freedom that we are so fortunate in this country to have, and that I think if we're not committed to preserving, we could lose. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, the comments I will make are much inspired by um, uh, my own university, Antioch University. Um, I'm in the PhD program for Leadership and Change. It is a private university, not horrible, Toby. It's a really good place. Um, it's a small program. We have about um, 150 students, nine faculty. We're just hiring uh, one or two more. Um, so um, without mentioning my university all the time, I will talk about a few principles, ten principles, um, which are not utopia, are, can be real. 
and for all the talk about um, raising fees and at whatever, we volunteered this year not to have a raise in salary um, because we thought it was not done with the crisis and we didn't raise the fees for students either because we thought it was not done either. Um, so 10 principles. One is that a university should not be a corporation but a learning community. A university where faculty, staff and students can be human beings with real feelings and aspirations where they can be a whole person and not a set of walking brains. Now almost without reflection, without hesitation, performativity culture has conquered most of our universities. The corporatization of academia, high competition, the increasing number of assessments and the, imp and the implied threat of not making the requirements creates chronic insecurity. Insecurity the constant pressure to live up to requirements may cause high levels of stress among students as well as academic staff and uh, uh, faculty. Insecurity can be draining, chronic tiredness mm -hmm. the result, and I think many of you might recognize that. So we can have a university that does not demand your life, but a university that interacts with other commitments in life, family, community engagement, and so on. So I started with saying university sh does not have to be a corporation. It should be a learning community. What is a learning community? A learning community is driven by curiosity. <coughs> learning happens everywhere, in and outside of the university. Students bring in their life experiences in relation to which your learning happens. And the more it relates to what you can see, feel, think is important, the more easy it is to learn. We all know that. All learning counts, not only learning in the university context, and that's the model with which um, I have been working the past five years. A learning community does not train for tests. It trains <coughs> for intellectual and emotional growth. And success is then not just a measure of individual achievement, but also the contribution that you make to the team or to the group you work with. It is about a contribution to shared learning, and that is what community is about. Second principle, university does not have to be teacher-centered, but it can be learning-centered. And so that moves beyond the idea of learner or student-centered. Truly learner or student-centered universities offer learning environment where the experience, the learning needs and potential of individual students and faculty are central, not a science model of reproducing disciplines. Learning-centered means that teachers learn together with the students and actually you're not even talking about teachers, you're talking about mentors and coaches. When peer learning and self-directed learning in, in that model learners are seen as self-directed. So when peer learning and self-directed learning is normal, faculty act more as mentors and not as instructors. The distinction between university and other lives blurs and university becomes a place where learning means that knowledge can be applied to real world problems. And when I say it blurs, it doesn't mean that university life takes over everything and eats up. Any, every energy and everything you have, but that the worlds blur in a sense that can be mutually interactive and mutually beneficial. Third principle, I think a university should have a real mission, not something plastic, not something cliched, but a real mission. One that reflects pressing so social, societal or global, global needs, things like freedom from discrimination, or environmental sustainability, or ending poverty. Faculty and students are expected then to contribute to solving these problems in whichever area they work, a link can be made, and will be supported in their offer efforts and evaluated accordingly. My own university um, has as a uh, mission um, the a statement by Horace Mann, the first Antioch president who said, be ashamed to die until you have achieved some victory for humanity. Now that's a huge statement, um, but it is a real mission. So faculty who are hired as well as students who are admitted are also, not only, but also assessed 
in relation to whether they will be or can be successful in contributing to that mission. Think about if a mission could also be ending poverty, freedom from discrimination, and so on. What could happen within a university context? Fourth principle, not publications as a measure of individual or university success, but the usefulness of knowledge, achievement for community <coughs> and humanity, and that reflects a little bit what I said about a useful and a real mission. A shift is taking place at most universities from the scholar producing the, the outstanding and really um, a meaningful paper or book to the highly competitive strategic entrepreneur who often publishes a lot of the same but knows how to obtain grants. <laughs> now, a better criteria would be what have you achieved for, you, for your community? How is your work being used? How has it made a difference in people's life? And I could, I mean, there, are, there is research in this respect that shows how um, the principle of the strategic entrepreneur, that that benefits more masculinities and so on, but I will leave that aside for the moment. Um, fifth, five, less campus and classroom, more focus on learning relationships. And that goes, and I, I, I think that uh, the next speaker might say more about that, the use of technology. Face-to-face -face is an important basis. I don't think one should substitute face-to-face -face for anything else. It is very important. At the same time, it does not have only to be face-to-face. -face. I work in a hybrid model. The basis is face-to-face. -face. Uh, students meet five times a year. They're adult students who have professional lives as well. And in between, you use all the technology that can be relevant and helpful to have a continuing and a very intimate and intense engagement. That is possible. But it shouldn't be only online or only classroom. I think uh, hybrid models are very <coughs> doable. And um, Apart from um, the, 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 the variation in learning, um, learning modalities, there's less waste of time in commuting between places, less boredom in the classroom. We all know about the multitasking while the teacher is talking, and there's less carbon print. Sixth principle, no competition but collaboration. Now, what does collaboration mean? in the context of university. <coughs> I can give two examples. First, it means that um, um, faculty and the university um, leadership and environment are responsible or take the responsibility for helping the students to build a learning community. Uh, for instance, in, in, in the work I do, I work, work only with PhD students, and whereas in many universities you hear students don't share their ideas, let alone exchange papers because there is so much competition. No, I am um, facilitating a dialogue group where about uh, 10 students share with each other their, their dissertation ideas, they exchange papers, they're writing their concept papers, they're getting very relevant feedback, and everybody tries to put their play, uh, put their, uh, imagine themselves in the position of the other students and think along, think along critically and not do anything else but s support your fellow student. Um, in, in terms of faculty, it means that you, 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 f you form a team, you work as a team, not as a group who um, has difference in salaries, who is jealous if one goes on a sabbatical and what have you, but where you work as a team in the sense that you know that what, the, what somebody else um, gets as a reward or whatever reflects on your whole program. And it also means that if you do not support every single member of the team to give their best, it reflects on the quality of the program. And that is real, and that's uh, how we work, and that is collaborative working. Um, seven, less peer review and more peer learning. We have seen that with the shift towards market-driven education, many universities have changed, and scholars are increasingly subjected to regimes of fear operating through peer reviewers and accredit accreditation and assessment procedures. It is a culture in which we have embraced meritocracy as an ideal model. Meritocracy presupposes that merit can be measured. Measurement means using uniform standards. 
me, standardization, on the basis of which comparisons can be made. Standardization comes with procedures to conform to pre-established one-fits-all criteria. The overvaluation of peer judgment breeds standardization and homo homogenization. It breeds conformity and it feeds the power of publishers. Peer learning is most efficient in a context not of homogeneity, but in a context of diversity. You learn more from different perspectives than from perspectives that are already similar to your own. This implies that diversity in the peer group is crucial for the learning process in itself. But diversity as such is only a first step. Truly transformative uh, learning emerges from content studied and analyzed also from non-dominant perspective. And faculty have to be aware and, and make themselves familiar with non-dominant perspectives as well. And to give an example of um, if you really take the principle that learning, and we work in a, with cohorts, that learning in a diverse group is better not only for the individual but for the quality of the whole learning community, it has, it, it, um, if you take that principle as, at, at heart, then it means that you um, admit students as whole persons. So not just as a 4.0 GPA. It doesn't say how you will be in collaboration. You might be very self-centered, keeping your things to your own, and you might not be a very good student in relation to others. Maybe you're not going to be part of our program. Um, it means that, but if you take the whole person, you without doing anything, you always end up with a diverse student group because you looked at whole persons as individual with everything they bring on board, not just a particular grade, not just a particular color or, or whatever. That um, already introduces the eighth principle, not homogenization but heterogeneity, and we don't have to say more about that. Um, related to heterogeneity is a ninth principle, less discipline, less disciplines, more transdisciplinarity. And I think that speaks for itself. Then the tenth, final, not quantity but quality. And I don't mean that as a, 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 a cliché. Um, I mean it in the sense of that accountability should not be in terms of produced quantities, but on how knowledge is be made useful. So I would say, less producing, more reflecting. What happens with all the relevant knowledge already out there that is not being used, not being applied? Rather than producing more of the same, universities can work together with practitioners and others to help translate complex knowledge into practice. Thank you. Uh, knowing that I was coming toward the end of this series of presentations, I figured many of the things that I might say would have been said already, and I think uh, I've, uh, th uh, that's happened. So I want to take a slightly different tack, which is um, we've heard a lot about sort of the characteristics of the university that we would like. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how you get there. Um, and I guess my fundamental premise is uh, there's more, more than one way and there's probably more than one model of where we want to get as well. So I, I think of this as the universities that we are for, not just the single model, because I think there's, there's going to have to be heterogeneity. And I want to reflect a little bit on my own experience. Um, I came from a university on a state that has been in an economic crisis for at least three decades. Uh, back in the early 1980s, uh, the state uh, made big budget cuts in the funding of public education and universities had to close down programs. Michigan was no exception. A, a number of programs got closed down or drastically cut. But at the time, we had a president, Harold Shapiro, who by training was an economist, and he looked at the situation and he felt that the state of Michigan was never going to recover in the way that it had been when it was a, sort of the, the prime uh, supplier of automobiles and related products. And so he began a process 30 years ago to reposition the university for that context. Now, the University of Michigan, as a result, has gotten a lot of attention because today the uh, state support for the university is less than 5% of the university's budget. Uh, and uh, that 
figure keeps uh, dwindling. And so one uh, p possibility that's been discussed is whether the University of Michigan, which has been historically one of the great public universities, is in the process of becoming a private university. And I think there are many uh, uh, fe features, or many things that are happening that uh, make that uh, possible. Uh, the other example that's always talked about is the University of Virginia, which has sort of had a similar kind of history. But what Harold Shapiro launched and what his successors uh, did was to say not just that, you know, we have to go find other money, but we have to rethink how the university is going to work in this kind of climate. And several things have happened that I think are really quite interesting. I mean, uh, today, the university's budget is fundamentally from tuition, from overhead on research grants, and from a fairly large endowment for a, a public university. Um, there still is some state money, and uh, I know the administration still says that if, it, if it's 5%, it's still 5% of a big number, and it's a non-trivial amount of money. What's happened, though, is that the university has uh, developed a, what I characterize as a very decentralized system. And I really contrast that with the University of California in my brief experience here. That each school and college is fundamentally a kind of a tub on its own bottom. They keep their tuition, they keep the overhead on grants that they develop, they keep the, the endowment funds that they raise. The, how the university functions as, a, as an institution is through a kind of, kind of sales tax, that the university uh, charges 11% when you spend a dollar, and uh, that, that, that's the, the source of revenue that supports things like libraries and the computer center and, and uh, dormitories and so on. Um, what's happened is the... Uh, the other piece of the culture, though, is while, while the university functions as uh, a series of uh, semi-independent schools and colleges, the central administration has put a huge priority on cooperation and on interdisciplinary programs. So they use the money from the state and other centrally raised sources of funding to incentivize people to cooperate, to work together, for the schools and colleges to collaborate on degree programs, on projects, uh, and so on. And it's been relatively successful. Uh, I was a part of the creation of the School of Information at Michigan, which in the early 90s arose from the former uh, School of Library Science. And uh, it's become, over the course of uh, 15 or so years, an incredibly successful uh, uh, unit and an incredibly cooperative unit. We, have, we had, I should say, speak in the past tense, I guess, uh, uh, um, degree programs with uh, many of the other schools at the university. Just uh, two years ago, before I left, they created an undergraduate program in informatics. There was a collaboration between the Liberal Arts College, the School of Information, and the Computer Science Department, and it's been very successful. So a lot of things have happened there that over a, a fairly long period of time that have really meant, made the university quite different than it was, say, back in the 1950s and 60s. However, the thing I want to point out, and that has become very visible to me by being at the University of California, is that there's some really unique features that Michigan had that made that path toward change possible. First of all, it's a very old university. It was founded in 1817, and it today has the largest base of living alums of any U.S. university. That is an incredible source of strength, because these people are loyal to the university, not just with giving money, but with supporting what the university does and so on. I think that's a very important uh, characteristic. I already mentioned the sort of administrative change that has made each school and college somewhat more independent, more decentralized, which has provided a real uh, context for entrepreneurialism and uh, doing things that, uh, that value your, your programs. Um, the other thing I would stress is that this process of change started 30 years ago, and it's not over yet. These are not the kinds of things that can be sort of re-engineered in a short period of time. It's taken 30 years, a number of committed uh, people at the university to sort of make this kind of thing happen. Um, so I think, I think uh, both Michigan and Virginia are sometimes pointed to as models for how we're going to deal with the economic climate that we're in. And I think most people agree that the public support for university education is probably never going to be restored to levels it used to be at before. But I guess what I want to caution is I think, I don't know the University of Virginia situation as well as I know Michigan, that there are a lot of sort of unique properties of what happened at Michigan that are not present in other contexts perhaps even the University of California. Well, another thing I want to mention is that uh, Michigan has no university system. Each university has their own board of regents. So again, the university is somewhat autonomous in the, in the broader political context of the, of the state, the way the state operates. Um, 
The other thing I want to mention, uh, the last speaker said maybe I would be talking about technology. Um, a lot, another, a lot of, uh, another conversation is often had is that, you know, the future of the university is to become a richer place for uh, distance learning. And indeed, a lot of universities are, are trying this. Um, it's sort of paradoxical to me that Michigan didn't, hasn't done that. In fact, the School of Information, where I spent the last 15 years before coming here, uh, deliberately eschewed that. We had a full-time face-to-face program for the students in the school. And I, I really agree that, I mean, I've, I've spent 25 years studying how collaboration happens at a distance. And uh, the, the simple conclusion is that it's very difficult. And distance learning in a university context is not simply pointing a camera at a faculty member. It's, it's really designing new programs from scratch. The, the most successful ones, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad, have really made a very large upfront investment in producing different kinds of things, not just the sage on the stage or even the, the seminar kind of context, but something that operates in a very different way. So I think that, again, distance learning as a possible solution to uh, what's, what's facing universities today is uh, a, a, an arena with a lot of uh, troublesome properties, and it can take a lot of thought and care to do that in a way that preserves the values that we have for uh, university education. And with that, I will step aside. Setting my timer for 13 minutes. So, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> oh, you know, it's funny. In some places, you say good afternoon, and people talk back to you. But uh, <laughs> on this campus, it's like, is anyone there? <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And of course, I um, am the last speaker. And as Gary Olson uh, pointed out, uh, many of the points that I wanted to make have, have, have been raised already. And let me just say that uh, last Monday I spoke on a panel that uh, addressed the trade-off between um, uh, the university and the prison system in the state. I see the organizers are sitting right there. Uh, uh, and Initially, when David asked me to be a part of this uh, panel on the university uh, we want, I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for us to let our imagination soar rather than being restrained and confined by the particular uh, um, crisis situations we confront uh, uh, today. And and as I thought about what my contribution might be, I asked myself questions about radical epistemologies and radical pedagogies. Uh, how might we conceive of a university that is um, committed to always interrogating the limits of common sense? Uh, not only the common sense of popular discourse, but also the, the common sense that is embedded in the theoretical apparatus and the methodological approach and the pedagogical assumptions that we use in producing knowledge within our various uh, disciplines and interdisciplinary fields. So, so I imagine myself saying, uh, I want a university that teaches all of us, students, and faculty as well as workers to develop intellectual habits that allow us not only to challenge what is, but also to challenge the tools we use to apprehend and analyze what is. How might we as students and faculty link our teaching and learning to progressive and indeed radical social transformation. So I, I, I saw myself getting up here and saying, I want a university that actively promotes change in the social world. And speaking of students and faculty, um, how might we create communities of teaching and learning 
that also embrace those who enable these processes, the workers on our various campuses. So I thought I would say I want a non-hierarchical university that encourages community across lines of race and class and gender and sexuality and nation. And I also want a university in which we do not practice environmental con conservation only for the sake of future human beings, but also uh, for those of us who are not human. <laughs> and I thought about raising questions regarding the seemingly inveterate individualism of the scholarly process. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I, as I was listening to Philomena, I, 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 I said, well, I'm going to say that I want a university that does encourage collaborative research from undergraduate to graduate education. I want a university that teaches us to imagine our work as part of the public good and not as individual possessions to be bought and sold on the capitalist market. And then, of course, uh, um, the racist and anti-Semitic events on the campuses of UCSD and UC Davis and then UCSC happened. And then there was the institutional assault here at UCI on the students who protested the presentation of the Israeli ambassador. And then Schwarzenegger attempted to narrate uh, all these events together as uh, you know, basically uh, the same, uh, not seeing the assault being on the students, but rather the assault being on the ambassador, right? And then I realized that it might be necessary also to think on a different register about the university we want, uh, which is not to say that all the other things uh, uh, aren't uh, extremely valuable. And and then, of course, the students mobilized as they did on March 4th. I really, I really appreciate that day. We'll forever remember March 4th because it's about marching forth, right? Uh, uh. And when all of this happened, I realized that this discussion about the university we want required some basic interventions about goals that many of us walk around imagining that we've long since accomplished at the university. Uh, and, you know, after all, this is 2010. It is, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not 2000. It's not 1990 or 1980 or 1970. It feels to me a lot like 1970. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I, I think that... Uh, it seems that administrations are less hospitable to student demands in 2010. And these are people who were informed by the student movement of the late 60s and the, and the, and the 70s. Uh, uh, and, and I was remembering my own experience on um, the campus of UCSD in 1968, uh, 69, mm. in which mm. many of us, um, well, there were only a handful of black students, probably about the same number there are today. <laughs> there may be a few more. I think it's 1.3% uh, at UCSD now. Uh, well, in any event, we developed uh, uh, an al alliance among black students, Latino students, uh, progressive white students, and we came up with this idea to demand that the third college, uh, at that time it was, they were, there were two colleges, uh, and they were in the process of developing the third, and we, we wanted to demand we did demand that the third college be called Lumumba Zapata College after an African revolutionary and a Mexican revolutionary, right? Uh, and we, we, I mean, the, the, the story of that campaign is really fascinating. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about it. But what I will tell you is that 
as um, graduate students and young faculty and undergraduates who had no idea really what we were doing, uh, we tried to reimagine the entire curriculum. And we wrote a new curriculum. And I, 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 I'm trying to uh, remember what it was like. I was a philosophy graduate student. And I seriously worked on this curriculum that included math and science, not only the humanities and social sciences, but how to teach math and science in such a way as to maximize racial, class, and gender justice. Uh, and we were very serious about that. I actually um, think I need to go into the archives and pull those uh, uh, documents, uh, uh, pull, you know, try to pull them again. And so thinking about these uh, struggles today uh, reminds me of how far we have come and how far we have not come. Uh, um, and as a, as a person who uh, was born into a family that valued education and that value that was accorded education had a great deal to do with uh, the way education was imagined in popular discourse in the aftermath of slavery, as education being uh, linked to uh, liberation. And I can tell you very briefly the story of my mother, who was a foster child and grew up in a, in a rural area, backwoods Alabama, where there were no high schools. Uh, uh, and she literally ran away from home after she graduated from elementary school because her parents thought she should go to work, her foster parents thought she should go to work, and she wanted to continue her education because she knew that education was, was, was liberation. And so she ran away to Birmingham, uh, which is where I ended up being born, and she lived in the YWCA in, in order to go to high school, and then of course she went on to college after that. Uh, and so I think of, um, I think of um, education as um, being, I've always thought of education as being uh, linked to freedom, as being linked to liberation. And as a person who has been um, active both as a um, social justice organizer and a scholar for, I'm not going to even tell you how many years now, uh, it, it it, it becomes increasingly apparent that uh, when, we, when we talk about liberation or freedom, uh, uh, it's, this is a, a category that uh, uh, has to be uh, acknowledged as capacious enough to contain um, you know, all of those, um, the dreams and aspirations we have now, as well as those uh, uh, ideas uh, uh, we um, come upon as a result of, 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 of uh, struggling for freedom. And so in the beginning, we may have thought freedom, freedom, is le at least for black people, was about freedom for the black man. And then we recognized that we had to bring gender into the picture, and it became much larger. Uh, uh, and then perhaps we thought that gender was uh, only about women and men, right? This binary structure of gender. And then we realized that actually uh, to conceive of gender in, these, in this binary form is uh, 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 quite um, uh, restraining. And therefore, we have to think about uh, multiple genders. Uh, as I, as I, I've said in a talk, uh, we can no longer think about two genders and five sexes. There are many, many more. Uh, the whole point I'm making is that uh, there are infinite um, dimensions of liberation and freedom. And I want a uh, university that can refashion and retool itself as we move forward, and a university whose institutional historical memory always reminds us how far we have come, but better still, how far we have to go. Thank you. <laughs>